want to invite you to open up your Bibles today to the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. 1 Peter 3, 13. You're going to have to forgive me today. I've, I've got a handheld because um, I feel really bad um, physically. I, I, I went and got tested for COVID. I'm negative, tested for the flu, tested for strep throat. So I think it's just good old-fashioned uh, Houston allergies. Anybody got that going on? So anyway, I'm actually feeling a little bit better than I did this morning. Apologize for the coughing and the sniffling and all that stuff. Um, but we'll get through this today. <clears throat> all right. So we, last week we looked at 1 Peter 3, 7. I'm actually skipping 8 through 12 because Peter really is summarizing a lot of what he's already talked about in the first couple of chapters. And we're going to focus in on verse 13 today. <clears throat> because in it, Peter makes a statement <clears throat> that is so contrary to human thinking that when you hear it, it, it borders on the absurd. He makes the statement that if you suffer, you're blessed. Y'all see what I'm saying? That goes against everything we think, everything we believe, that if we suffer, we're blessed. But I don't know about you, but I spend the majority of my time here on earth trying to avoid suffering, not looking at it as a blessing. For example, I'll give you an example about how I like to avoid suffering. I, uh, back in Austin, we had a dog. His name was Marley. She was a schnauzer and I love that dog. She was, uh, she was my buddy. And the reason I love that dog is because every day of my life I came home, she was excited to see me. When I come home and my kids see me, I might get a head nod, right? From my kids. <clears throat> but this dog, when she saw me, it acted like it was the greatest moment of her life that I was walking into the house. She lost her mind. Now the problem, as much as I love the dog, my wife hated the dog. And she hated the dog for two reasons. Number one, she barked a lot. And number two is Marley loved to get in bed with us. And my wife is not a big fan of dogs being in the bed. <clears throat> and so this dog, when Jennifer would leave, go out of town, wasn't at the house, whatever, <clears throat> the dog would walk in. If I'm laying on the bed and the dog would look at me like, hey dad, she ain't here, right? <laughs> If you let me in the bed, we can snuggle. Let's do this, you know? And so whenever the dog did that, what I had to do is I had to ask myself this question. How much suffering am I willing to endure at the hands of my wife if I get caught with this dog in bed, right? And every time I chose to avoid suffering. And so that's what we spend the majority of our time doing. Whether we think about it or not, we avoid suffering in our lives, which is why this statement that Peter makes is so contrary to our thinking. Peter says, when you suffer, you're blessed. Now, it's important to remember that Peter is writing to a group of people that were in the early church. <clears throat> there were young Christians in the first century that were experiencing the beginning of what would be a massive persecution against Christians. It, it, a lot like our culture is that they were on the front end of a culture that was inc going increasingly hostile to Christianity. <clears throat> I don't know how bad it's gonna get in the United States, but it got really bad for them. And so he's writing them and he's doing two things. Number one is he's gonna, he's gonna quote Jesus on the S Sermon on the Mount and, and remind them that their Lord and Savior Jesus Christ said that suffering being, brings blessing. And then at the end of our time in First Peter here, he's going to basically give us a couple of steps that we need to remember when persecution for our faith comes. Like, here's what you do when this happens. And so let's jump in. <clears throat> Read the first part of the text, First Peter 3.13. Peter begins and he says, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? He says, who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? So he begins um, in this discussion of, of blessing through suffering. He asks the question like, hey, look, who's there to harm you if you're, if you're doing what's right, if you're doing what's good? And I find that an interesting question to ask. 
Because if I'm a New Testament, first century Christian that's reading this, who is there to harm me for doing what's good? I'm thinking in that moment, well, Peter, actually, I have a pretty long list. People there, they're trying to harm me because I'm doing what's good. If I'm them, I'm thinking, Peter, I've got a boss that wants to fire me because I'm a Christian. Um, People have stopped coming to my business because I'm a Christian. My friends won't come over to my house for dinner anymore because we're Christians. And by the way, the government has threatened to put me and my family in prison because we're Christians. And so, yeah, Peter, <clears throat> there's actually a, a lot of folks that are trying to harm me for doing what's good. Well, it's almost as if Peter anticipates that that would be their response. Because watch what he says in the next verse. Look at verse 14. He said, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. He's trying to comfort them. Suffering is going to come. There are actually all kinds of people that are gonna try to harm you for doing what's right. But then he says, but in the midst of that, I got good news. When you suffer for righteousness sake, not because you're an idiot, but when you suffer because of righteousness, he says, that is actually a blessing. Okay, now again, if I'm in the first century right there reading this, I'm probably thinking, I don't know, Peter, last time I checked, me going to prison is not a blessing. So what in the world are you talking about? Well, here's what Peter's doing. He's actually quoting Jesus in Matthew 5. Don't turn there, but just listen. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. <clears throat> Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And then in the last beatitude, watch what Jesus says, Matthew 5, 10. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. There's that crazy backwards thinking again. Blessed are those who are persecuted. For righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so the last beatitude Jesus talks about is persecution. He says you're blessed if you're persecuted. Now, if you remember, I taught on this back about a year ago. And the beatitudes, what's fascinating to me is that the beatitudes are like a chain. One leads to another. One results in the next one. <clears throat> and so in essence, what Jesus is saying is that if you're meek, if you're pure in heart, if you're a peacemaker, if you show mercy, if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, the end result of that is you're going to be persecuted for it. That's fascinating to me. Why in the world does the world want to persecute us for being meek, pure-hearted, merciful peacemakers? When they see us being merciful peacemakers, why does that want to make them attack us? Well, Jesus actually gives us the answer in John chapter 8, verse 42. He tells us why it happens. So I'm going to read that to you. John 8, 42. Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. <clears throat> He's speaking to the scribes. And he says to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I'm here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. And they asked him a question. He said, why do you not understand what I say? <clears throat> and he gives them the answer. He says, it's because you cannot bear to hear my word. And so he's looking at these people and he says, here's the problem. The reason that you're not actually following God is because you can't bear to hear my word. He's saying you can't handle it. You can't tolerate it. Now why? Why can they not tolerate or bear to hear his word? He tells them in verse 44, he says, here's why. Because you are of your father, the devil. Gosh, Jesus, that's kind of harsh. But he says, look, the reason that you can't bear to hear my word, the reason you can't tolerate it is because your dad's Satan. And he's speaking to Pharisees. He's speaking to religious people right there. I would imagine their jaws dropped. He said, the reason you're not following the word, the reason you can't even handle to hear it is because your dad's Satan. And what Jesus says is really a difficult thing. He says that basically every human being on planet earth has one of two dads. Either your father is God or your father's Satan. He's not saying that there's a third group of people. You know, you got people, God as their father, people, Satan as their father, and then this third group of people that don't really care and they're just kind of neutral. He says either God's your father or Satan is. And so if Satan is your father, 
when you encounter someone and you see them living this merciful, peacemaking, pure-hearted life, you can't bear it because what that does is when you see that life for a person who has Satan as their father, that is going to expose their rebellion against the one true God. It's going to expose their rebellion. It's going to expose their emptiness. And they're not going to applaud you for it. They're not going to say, hey, man, thank you so much for showing me my empty, rebellious existence against God. They're going to hate you for it. Righteousness, like by its very nature, is confrontational to a world that has Satan as their dad. <clears throat> I'll give you one quick example. I could give you a hundred. A few weeks ago, there was a United States senator that, <clears throat> sorry guys, tweeted Matthew 5.11. He didn't comment on it. He didn't even say Jesus sent. He just quoted this. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, Matthew 5.11. He just put the words of Jesus on a tweet and hit sin. That's it. And people that were commenting on their lost, their ever-loving mind. The venom that he were, was poured out on this guy because he simply quoted Jesus was mind-blowing. And I'm reading it. I'm like, well, y'all are kind of proving Jesus' point, people. Right? <laughs> But that's a, that's a mild example of something the scripture promises us over and over and over again. That Christ's likeness in you will expose the rebellion in others and it will produce the same result every single time that it did for the apostles, that it did for the first century church, that it did for Jesus, that it's done for every single pretty much generation in history maybe besides ours. And that is persecution. It's coming. Jesus promised us it would. And that's a little scary. It's kind of unnerving to think that it's been promised to us. It's scary unless you believe what Jesus said would be the result of our persecution. It's a cause for fear. It's a cause for anger. It's a cause for a lot of things unless you truly believe what Jesus said the result of our persecution would be. So let's watch what Jesus said would be the result of our persecution. Back to Matthew 5.10. He says, blessed are those, okay, so we're blessed. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11, blessed are you when others revile you, persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you, falsely on my account. So verses 10 and 11, he says, when you're persecuted because of righteousness, here's the thing you understand, you are blessed. Now why are we blessed because of persecution? In verse 12, he tells us, Matthew 5, 12, he says, rejoice and be glad. Why? For your reward is great in heaven. That's it. I had two people say amen. That's it. Jesus said persecution comes. It's coming. Because your godliness reveals their rebellion. He said don't flip out. Don't be afraid. Don't get mad. He said throw a party. Put the party hats on. Bring out the karaoke machine. Rejoice. Be glad. Why? Jesus drops a bomb on us. He said, hey, because your reward in heaven is going to be great. And, and the reason that that doesn't just blow our minds and we, and we don't just start shouting at the top of our lungs and crying and, be, and like, bring on suffering then, Jesus. It's because I don't think our minds fully comprehend what the Lord means when the Lord says great. I think our minds really can't conceive that. We have a really low view of great, actually, I'm, I'm finding out. <clears throat> the other day, I was, uh, was driving back from a conference I was speaking at, and it was in the middle of the night, and I had not gotten to eat much all day. I was getting ready for this conference, and after I'd preached, and the only thing I could find open was a McDonald's, and um, McDonald's is not good, y'all. I'm just telling you, it's not. I'm sorry if you own a McDonald's, and y'all need, need help, but anyway, I ordered a Big Mac, and, and, uh, and I'm eating it. I ordered two Big Macs. Sorry, Jennifer. Um, I did, and uh, I'm eating it. You know, it's solid. It's decent, 
But then some, one of my friends calls me and he's like, hey, how are you doing? You, you were staying awake? I'm like, yeah, I'm good. And he's like, what are you doing? I was like, well, I'm eating a Big Mac. He's like, how, how, how is it? How's the Big Mac? I said, it's, it's great. It's great. And I just threw it out there. It's not great, people. It's like a piece of cardboard with some special sauce on it. Y'all with me? The point is, is that we throw great out there all the time. And so our conception of what great is probably falls short of what the king of the universe's conception of what great is. Give you an example. Heaven. I have an idea of what heaven will be like. I, I have my own concept of it. I'm actually pretty much decided I'm going to teach a series on it in August. And one thing we know for sure is that heaven, we're not just hanging out in the clouds, but he actually, God creates a new earth. It's without sin. And that's where we live forever. And I'm convinced that we'll work on the new earth. And you're like, well, Matt, that doesn't sound like fun. Well, here's the thing. There was work in the garden before sin. And then when sin came in, that's when it messed up work. That's when work became a drudgery. And so God created work to be a blessing and a joy. And he's bringing it all back to Eden. He's making everything new. And so I think there'll be work in the new earth, but I think you're going to love it. It'll be something you look forward to every day, and it's a lot of joy, a lot of fulfillment. And so I've actually asked God what I would like to do, or told him, rather, what I'd like to do when, when I get to heaven. I want to be a farmer. I really do. That's what I want to do. It sounds underwhelming, and that is the point. I want to get in my tractor and just plow my fields and not talk to anybody. I don't want to, I don't want to preach. I don't want to do nothing. I just want to plow my fields. The thing I've got in my mind, y'all ever seen Gladiator, that scene in Gladiator where the Gladiator dude's walking and it's like he's got the wheat and the, that's it. That's what I want. And so that's about as, as great as a concept that I can get in my mind. That if I get to tend my crops for eternity and be in the presence of Almighty God. That sounds awesome to me. But I just got a feeling. I just got a feeling that my understanding of what great is just really does fall short of what the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords says what great is. And Jesus said, when persecution comes, you need to throw a party. Because great will be your reward in heaven. So I think what that means is that our reward is going to be so far more bigger, better, more awesome, more amazing than we could ever imagine to the point that when we receive it and we're walking in it, we'll be glad we went through the suffering. We'll be glad we went through it. It's going to be that amazing. And so Peter, he says, in light of that, in light of that, here's what you do. All this stuff makes all the sense in the world. First Peter 3.13. He says, now who is there to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. And now we know what that means. Great is our reward in heaven. Then he says, okay, we know we're blessed when persecution comes to righteousness. So what do we do? What's our response? When this actually starts happening, what do we do? Look at 1 Peter 3, 14. He starts telling us. He says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. And so here's the first thing we do. He says, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. You look out there and you realize, my goodness, Christians are being persecuted. My goodness, we're, be call we're being called bigoted because of our beliefs that are 2,000 year old from the word of God. People say we're hateful. People say that we're horrible. People are losing their jobs. People are being sued. And Peter says, hey, that's a blessing, so don't even be afraid. And then he takes it a step further. And he says, have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Isn't that kind of flippant to you? Because what Peter just said is, hey, when, when, and when, persecution and suffering comes in your life, don't even let it bother you. That's intense. And so let me stop right there and just ask you, Sagemont, how y'all doing with that? With the whole, don't be afraid, don't even let it bother you. How y'all doing? I'm not. <laughs> I want to confess that this persecution stuff kind of scares me, to be totally honest with you. I'm not doing very good at it. 
a couple of years ago, um, I got invited to this conference. It was actually in Hawaii. We were suffering for Jesus. And, and it was an invitation <laughs> by this, uh, this huge law firm that specializes in dealing with cases where religious liberties are being infringed. And they, that's all they do. Exclusively, they defend Christians that are being prosecuted because of religious stance, religious conviction. And one of the examples that they gave us, <coughs> there was this family-owned pharmacy. I can't remember the state it was in. I think it was in, I think it was Pennsylvania, maybe. I can't remember. Uh, but it was a family-owned pharmacy. They'd owned it for 30 years. His family are very, they're devout Christians. And so they made the decision that they did not want to sell the morning after pill. So the morning after pill is a pill, you can take it within 24 hours of intercourse and if there's been a conception, it will end the pregnancy. Family believes the Bible, that all life is made in the image of God, and that life begins at conception, that we're fearfully and wonderfully made, so they made the decision not to sell the morning after pill. <clears throat> Sounds pretty reasonable. We're Christians, right? They can make that call. It's their business, right? Well, they even took it a step further. <clears throat> Instead of not just selling it, when someone brought them a prescription, they would lovingly explain why, and then they'd give them five different pharmacies within a two-mile radius that would sell them the pill. Seems pretty reasonable. Well, somebody sued them. And after the initial stuff, the U.S. government uh, got involved and put the weight of the U.S. government um, against them. And after 30 years of being in business, they were forced to close down because they took one stance that said, hey, we, we don't believe this is right. That was one of a thousand cases that that law firm was trying in our country. Let that sink into you guys. It's a thousand cases, and this was three years ago. <clears throat> As I walked out of that conference, the overwhelming thing I was feeling was fear. I'm like, my goodness. It, if it's like this now, if we live in a culture that's this hostile to Christianity now, <clears throat> what's it going to be like 20 years from now? When are they going to start coming for the church? What are my kids going to experience in their lifetime if it's this difficult now? And I'll be honest with you, it actually scared me. I was experiencing, because I'm just giving you the surface of what I heard. I heard some crazy stuff that would curl your toes, and I walked out of there fearful. But what our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is saying, he's saying, hey, man, don't be afraid. It's coming. It's no big deal. I got you. And here's the reason you can get through this. Matthew 5, 11, he said, you're blessed when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great. And oh, by the way, they did the same thing to the prophets who've gone before you. You're just standing in a long line of people that have suffered for the cross. Jesus said, don't, don't flip out. Don't be angry. Rejoice because of the hope that you have of your future reward in heaven. So let's look at the last part here. So the first thing we do, we realize we're blessed, and so we don't need to be afraid. We don't even need to let it bother us because our reward in heaven is great. He goes on. Here's what you do. He says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. He says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy. Watch what he says. He says, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness. I'm going to read it again. Verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Scripture saying, number one, do not be afraid. Rejoice because we got a great reward in heaven. And here's the second thing that we're, we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be ready to make a defense to anyone who asks us for the hope we have in the midst of persecution. Now, what hit me in that is what Peter doesn't say. Peter doesn't say, hey, always be prepared to make a defense to anybody who asks you about the existence of God. That's good, but that's not what he says. 
He didn't say always be prepared to give a defense to anyone who asks you for the biblical definition of marriage. That's not going to get their attention. He doesn't say, hey, always be prepared to give a defense to anyone who asks you for why a family pharmacy ought to have the constitutional right to sell the morning after pill. What he says is be prepared to give a defense to anyone who asks you for the hope that you have in the midst of your persecution. And his point is this, is that when persecution comes and it's coming, the hearts of a lost world are going to be one, not when we respond in anger, not when we respond in fear, but we respond in the hope of our God who is on his throne and who's gonna reward us lately. And we gotta always be prepared. When people look at us and they see the hope, hey, here's my hope, his name's God. He wins, right? Which brings me here to kind of the last part. I'm going to start landing the plane. What is our hope? How's this a blessing? Persecution comes. It doesn't even bother us. Why? They ask us, why? Our hope in God. What is the hope? Well, the first one we've already, we've already talked about. Great is our reward in heaven. That's number one. That's, that's the hope we have, is that as life is over, we die we go to heaven, the reward will make all the suffering worth it. But here's the other reason for the hope we have within us that we can give a defense for when somebody asks. And the number two reason we have hope is easy. We win. We win. Check this out. The battle against Christ and his church that's raging around us and is getting more intense <laughs> One of the reasons we don't have to be afraid, one of the reasons we don't even have to let it bother us is because we win. And we know that for a couple of reasons. Number one, Jesus said that upon the rock of the gospel, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And his point is that when every king and every kingdom and every government and every institution and every empire has done their best to try to take Christianity out, we will still be standing. When every empire and every kingdom has come and gone, we'll still be standing. And by the way, it's been 2,000 years. He's right. Y'all ever heard of the Roman Empire? Kind of a big deal. Kind of a really big deal. They tried their hardest to take out Christianity. The, the emperor made it a personal vendetta to kill everybody. Guess what? Rome's not here anymore. The Roman Empire is gone. Hey, we're still here. Sage my church. We, Jesus was right. Y'all with me? We win. But here's the other reason. And this is cool. And this hit me <coughs> this week. I've, I've never thought about this before. One of the reasons that we know we win, number one, is Jesus told us we were going to win. <coughs> 2,000 years have gone by and so far he's right. And here's the second reason. We've actually seen a picture of the end. And we, we know because we've seen the picture about how it all turns out. Let me explain to you what I mean. <clears throat> I've told you before that, that in Austin at my kid's previous school, I coached football. I was the offensive coordinator for all four years that my son was uh, a varsity football player. And... Um, JD's senior season, we made it to a state championship game. So it was their last game they're ever going to play. It was a state championship. And I was particularly nervous and particularly feel, fearful on that night before that game. And here's why. Because in the very first season I coached them, eight years before, when they were in the sixth grade, they were just little kids, hadn't even hit puberty yet. <clears throat> I got roped into coaching them, and we got destroyed that year. They were just little babies, really. And we went one and seven. And I told them on one particular game, and we just gotten destroyed. I said, look, if y'all will stick together and y'all will work hard, one day you're going to win a state championship. Well, sure enough, here it is, eight years later. A lot of blood, a lot of sweat, a lot of tears, a lot of puke later, and there we are. It's the last game, and we're in the state championship, and I'm a basket case. Because I want that for those boys more than they want it for themselves. I wanted it so bad, and I was pretty scared. So I want you to imagine 
that on the night before the game, when I'm a wreck, when I'm fearful, when I'm worried, what if somehow, some way, somebody would have come back from the future and shown me a picture of the end of the game? Somehow, somebody gets in a time machine, comes back night before the game, shows me a picture of the end of the game. What if they were to show me this picture? I got just a little simple picture I want to show you. That's my son, J.D. Good looking kid. Got that from his mom. (laughs) Played quarterback. He actually got an offer to play quarterback at Tulsa, but because he's spirit led, he went to Texas A&M University. (laughs) But what if on the night before the game, I'm, I'm sitting there in my room, stomachs in knots, and somebody walks in and says, hey, I'm from the future. I want to show you one picture. And they show me this picture. It's a picture of after the game. What do you think happens in the game? I'd say, well, look at his towel. There's blood on it. That means the battle's already been fought, right? We know it's the end of the game. Here's the other thing I see. There's, he's wearing a blue medal around his neck, and I know for a fact that the champions get the blue medal. And so I'm like, this picture shows me that, that we win, that we win. And if you would have showed me that picture the night before the game, let me ask you a question. I know, I'm like, that's the end of the game. I know we win. The blood has been shed. The victory has been won. You show me that picture the night before the game, am I scared? Not scared at all. I instantly have a calm that comes over me. Am I nervous? No, I'm not nervous. I'm just soaking in every moment. Am I, am I freaking out? No. I'm completely and totally at peace. And if somebody comes up to me and says, Matt, you seem so calm. How are you doing that? Matt, you remember when we were walking out on the field and the other team was mocking us as we were walking across? You just looked at them. You didn't retaliate. You just smiled at them. How did you do that? What, what, what is, where is this hope coming from that you seem so confident? I would just look at that person and this is what I would say. I would say, I've seen a picture of the end of it. We win. We win. I'm not nervous. I'm not scared. I'm not afraid. It doesn't even bother me when they call my names because we're about to beat them down. What if I were to tell you that someone has come back from the future and they showed us a picture of the end of all things? His name is John. He was a disciple that Jesus loved. He was exiled to the island of Patmos at the end of his life. And he was given a vision of the end of all things. And here's what it is. Here's the picture that he showed us in Revelation 17, 14. John said, hey, they're going to make war on the Lamb and the lamb will conquer them. For he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. And then Revelation 21, three says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eye. And death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, oh yeah, one more thing, write all this down, because my words are faithful and they are true. That's our hope. That's it. And so when the world does their best, you don't be afraid. When the world does their best, you don't flip out. You don't even let it bother you. You just smile at them. And when they ask you about the hope you have within you, you say, I'm not worried. I've seen the end. We win. That's it. I'll end with this. There's a hymn that we're about to sing. (coughs) Had its origins in Assam, India in the 1800s. It's based on the final words of a man from the Gali tribe in India who had become a, a Christian through the efforts of an English missionary. The village chief learned of this guy that was in his tribe that had become a Christian through the English missionary. The chief got really mad and he captured this man and his wife. 
and his children. They tied him up. The chief told the guy, if if you don't renounce your faith in Jesus Christ, we're going to kill you. Well, he looked at the chief and he gave one simple response. He said, I have decided to follow Jesus. Chief turned and killed his wife and two children. He looks at the man again and gave him one opportunity, one more opportunity to recant his faith. The guy looked at the chief again and said, though none go with me, I still will follow. And the chief killed him too. In the days to come, the chief was so moved by the unshakable faith of this man that he went and he found the English missionary and told him the story of what happened. And so the chief asked the missionary, how in the world was this man able to cling to his faith in the midst of unimaginable suffering? And the missionary gave a defense to the chief of the hope that the man had in Jesus Christ. The chief gave his heart to Christ also. The story of this man's faith would get passed on and passed on for the next hundred years until 1959, an American hymn writer composed a song that would be made popular by Billy Graham and it would be sung all over the world. It simply says, I have decided to follow Jesus. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Guys, we're gonna sing it today and I want everybody to look at me. Don't, don't mess with your Bible, don't, don't move around. I just want you to look at me. I'm, I'm done here in 10 seconds. As we do this, as we sing this song, let it be more than a song you just sing before you go to lunch. Don't sing it to Jimmy. Don't sing it to the walls. Don't sing it to the ceiling. Don't sing it to the air. I want you to turn your eyes upon Jesus, and I want you to sing those words to the Lord. I have decided to follow Jesus. Sing it as a prayer. Sing it as a declaration over your life right now and sing it as a declaration over your future. Though none go with me, I still will follow. That no matter what comes, no matter what happens, even if none go with you, you follow Jesus. Let's pray. Father, the reality is, is that for most of us, this is theory. It hadn't come yet. We haven't experienced in the way that our brothers and sisters in Libya have and Syria, and all over the Middle East, Southeast Asia, China. Their brothers and sisters right now as we speak, having to live this out. So, Father, before we go and eat lunch and forget about this whole sermon, help us to take a moment and say, Jesus, if this comes in our lifetime, you're worth it. The none go with me. I'm following you. Lord Jesus, you are worth it. And I thank you for the victory we have in you when this is all said and when it's all done. And so, Lord, it's a joy to worship you now. In Jesus' name, amen.